Well, I'm thankful for uh, Sister Melissa's calling. It was pretty much like an introduction to my sermon, so we're, we're, it's, it's good to see that we're thinking along the, the same lines here. I'm going to go ahead and read the text again um, for the benefit of the tape. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace which is to be brought unto you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this first phrase here, we're talking about girding up the loins of our mind. Um, this is an action that, which really has been all but forgotten in our time. There's, there's not really a prevailing interest in our day in what we use our minds for, what, what, what we think about. Uh, the, the Apostle Peter realized this when, when he wrote to the believers here that what you spend your time contemplating, what, what you expose your mind to, has a, um, it has a tremendous effect on the direction in which you go in your life. It, it, the, the mind is a stewardship. The, the capacity to reason, the capacity to think and to contemplate is something that has to be tended to. Um, the capacity to meditate, it has to be carefully used. And, and this is more significant than I think people generally realize. And this is true even in the flesh. People in the flesh, they realize this, that if you don't train your mind, if, if you're not constantly using your mind to reason upon things, that, that you can become dull. Uh, people invest uh, lots and lots of time in, in education and, and, and trying to, to train and, and learn things. And, and the, the people spend a tremendous amount of effort teaching their children, you know. But uh, unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of people who don't spend a lot of time concerned about their children's spiritual education. Uh, this is something that has, that, that has to be done as well. Now, it is possible just by the normal routine of living in this world, just, just things for necessary uses to, for, for you to become dull, for, for the edge to be knocked off of this. If you don't live intentionally with this in mind, um, if you don't invest your time in um, considering the things of God and, and uh, living intentionally to become abundantly familiar with Scripture, this really will have an incalculable effect upon your life. And, and, and not simply just because knowing Scripture of itself will make you grow, but this is the means by which God through Christ, through the vehicle of the Holy Spirit, reveals himself to you. I mean, it, it, think about it. What do you know about God that you did not, that wasn't revealed to you in the Scripture? Yeah. Nothing. I mean, that, this is the primary means of God's revelation is through his word. And uh, it's, it's popular in our day for people to talk a lot about experience and, and a lot about emotions and things like this. But God does not really reveal himself to you primarily through an experience or through an emotion. It's, it's through knowledge. It's through a message. It's through a word. Um, and and I, I've, ran, I've run into this here recently because um, there was uh, somebody on Facebook is uh, talking a comment, and he, he what he said to somebody was, if if all you need to know about God is in the Scripture, then that's good enough for you. But I I couldn't really understand the Scripture, so I learned about God through my own personal experiences and my trials and tribulations and and things like this. But this is this isn't right, and and really most often it's not your experience that um, clarifies the Scripture to you. Really, the the Scripture clarifies your experience. Yeah. The kingdom is a kingdom of knowledge. It's a kingdom of, of revelation. God made you with a mind for a reason, for it to be used and to enter into fellowship with him, to, and to enter into intelligent, cognizant fellowship with him. So the failure to exercise your mind to, to, do, to uh, fail to do that, it does have grave consequences. Uh, to be sure, nobody lives wholly without thinking about it. Wrong living is a, is a, a product of um, wrong thinking. To, to say it in the way that our brother Ricky said in the past, if you think wrong, you'll do wrong. That's just, that's true. So for the most part, uh, the church of our day isn't considered a thinking church. And this, this lack of emphasis upon our conscious involvement and in reasoning according to the truth that's prevalent now, it's not, this is not the kingdom norm. In fact, this is a digression from the way that the believers were in Scripture. Uh, Paul uh, exhorted Timothy with this word. He told him, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly unto them, that thy profiting may, may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, for c continue in them. 
for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And there are several times when the um, writers in the epistles, they prayed for the brethren that they would have understanding, that they would, be, they would know what the will of the Lord is, that they would be knowledgeable, that they, that they would um, be built up and rooted and grounded in their faith and their knowledge in the Lord. Now, as it concerns the text at hand, this is something we've spoken about in the past, but this, this phrase, to gird up the loins of your mind, it's, it's an allusion to the action of, of, of lifting up the clothing around your waist to, 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 to where you wouldn't be hindered from moving about. At, at the time when he wrote this, it was common for them to have this, this uh, garb that went all the way down to the floor, and if, if you didn't take that and tuck it into your belt... If you were ready for action, it, it hindered your movement. You were, weren't able to move about quickly. In general, um, the word loins refers to one's you know, waist area, but it's used more specifically in Scripture um, like the generative capacity of men. In Scripture, it's used this way several times. And just an example, in Genesis 35, the Lord told um, Jacob, Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So in, in reference to our text, this is a, this is a good picture. And um, some of the translators in the rendering of the text, they, they simply just say, be clear-minded or, or think clearly. And, and while that's, that's uh, the, uh, that, uh, the idea of that's in the text, the act of girding up your loins, it refers to removing a hindrance. The point is that it does so so that something productive can be done. Uh -huh. Uh, I like the way the Good News translation said it. They said, so then have your minds ready for action. Your mind has a certain productive capacity that, that, that can be ignored if you don't live intentionally with this in mind. Uh, you have the spiritual potential to attain more than you can possibly imagine in your capacity to think and to reason in Christ Jesus. In the sixth chapter of Ephesians, when Paul speaks um, about, about the armor of God, he speaks about this word. He says, stand for having your loins gird about with truth. Um, as it concerns our minds, when we are the most ready for spiritual activity, when we are gird about with truth. Uh, the, the truth makes us free. Whenever we, it, it removes this hindrance of error and of stumbling and, and uncertainty to where we can, we can move about, we can walk. We are quick to be able to act and respond to things. Now, when we talk about the power of the influence that truth is able to have on you, this, this really, it makes sense. This ought not to be surprising because man was made in the image of God. A man was made for this purpose to be able to fellowship with him. So you are actually most suited to serve the Lord. If you're living for God in every aspect of your being, you will be better. There's, there is no... Um, Hindra there's no hindrance that is introduced from, from serving the Lord. And this is especially, true, especially true as it concerns your mind. Really, if you think about it, men ought to be able to use their minds for Christ more fully than they ever used it for Satan. Uh, the, the truth can take hold of you more fully than deception ever did. You can actually be more convinced of the realities of heaven than you ever were of the benefit of living for yourself. A sin, it's, it's really a per, uh, perversion of your makeup as a being. So if, if Satan, who's an inferior in every way to God, if he can rule over your heart and mind with his temptations and, and, and through your evil nature abound in wickedness in you, how much more then can God fill you with his spirit? If, if your mind was able to be filled with evil, if, if Satan was able to erect these strongholds of thought in your mind, then how much more can God through Christ renew you in the spirit of your mind? How, how, how much more can he erect holy strongholds of, of thought and reasoning in your mind? Now, there's a, a general tone in a lot of the religious talk of our day that really glorifies Satan, whether they realize, realize it or not. It, it overemphasizes the power that Satan has over the individual. And we, we recognize that the devil is a cunning adversary and that if it were just up to us and our own power, he is more powerful than we ever were and that he wreaked havoc in the lives of everybody in humanity and, and everyone was at one time in bondage to him. However, this is not the state of those who are in Christ Jesus. We should not talk as if we are still fundamentally in, fundamentally in bondage to Satan. Amen. This is not the case. 
There is a freedom in Christ Jesus. The one who is in you is really greater than the one who's in the world. If there's anybody out there who's not living up to what the scripture says the people in Christ are, it's, a, it's of no fault of what Jesus has done. Amen. It's not because what Jesus has done is not powerful enough to deliver you from the bondage of sin. It's because they're not living up to it. It's because they really haven't entered into it. Because there, there really is power. We really are saved from the power of sin as well as, as the, um, the guilt of it. I, I, I assure you, brethren, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It did. It's not, not it can or it should. It did. As to not digress too far away from the text we're looking at, this is especially true in the area of our minds. This, this girding up of this pro, uh, productive capacity of our minds, it's not like a goal to, to, to attain to. You know, one of these days we'll get around to, to doing this. This is the norm for, for believers to be able to actually use their mind profitably to be able to engage in kingdom labors. This is the means by which we, we, are, we are participating in this willingly and knowledgeably. So secondly, he exhorts them and he tells them, be sober. Now, while the, uh, this world and this word of you know sobriety in our day, a lot of people think of it primarily referring to abstaining from drunkenness and then the form of drugs and alcohol and things like that. But um, the idea of sober is more than just not being drunk. Mm -hmm. Just like being holy is not just defined as not being evil. Sobriety is the absence of anything that would hinder the ability of the believer to see things according to truth, as well as anything that would prevent them from reacting quickly and appropriately to all things. Yeah. It's a, you, you are free from the hindering influence so that you can do something. That's, yeah. that's what the, sobriety is not a state that, uh, that you can attain to that doesn't require any more attention. It's, it's something that necessarily requires maintaining. In, in the case of believers, it requires a continual conscious choice to, to choose the good and to refuse the evil, to not involve yourself in anything that, that would cause this, this kind of a hindering influence. Now, the, the real point for the necessity of being sober is, is what you are able to do when you are in this state. Uh, you, you're alert. You're able to deal with things accordingly. You, you're, you're able to assess things correctly. You're able to act when action is required, and, 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 and you, can, you can act appropriately. Now, although generally it is well known that believers ought to abstain from drunkenness in the form of earthly hindering substances, which in our generation, that's not necessarily the case, but there is a certain spiritual drunkenness that can occur that a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, people, a lot of people don't think of it in, in this light. Uh, there are people who have actually become inebriated by popular culture, by, by entertainment, by, by the philosophy of men. And uh, people have even become drunken by religious tr tradition. Some are drunk with the cares of this world or, or the care of their family, of their finances. And they're actually hindered. These, these things are actually retarding their response to God because of something that they have embraced that's caused a separation between them and God. It's, it, 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 I would say that it's even more serious in, in the case of those who, who have embraced something religious because it's less obvious. It's actually more difficult to come out from. So that they've actually imbibed something that affects the way that they perceive the world around them. It, it, it puts blinders up so, so to where they can't really see things the way they are in reality. In the case of people who are religious, it, it's like laying a temple at a, on, on top of scripture. It, it, they actually read the scripture a different way. They have these, the, the, this, um, gl these glasses, as it were, that makes it say a different thing. Um, this is actually the default state of man is, is in this condition. We are born as, as addicts of self and sin. Uh, we're born with rose-colored glasses when it comes to humanity that really makes us not look quite as bad as, as, as we should. And um, in the life of anyone who's ever truly had an encounter with Jesus uh, to the saving of their souls, there was a point at which this cloud was lifted. There was a point at which they were able to see things as they really are and they realized I am a sinner and I need to come to God. I, I, I cannot stand before a holy God by myself. 
And this, this newfound sobriety, though, the, when they're in this state, it's not in an, an end of itself. It was the clearing away of this hindrance of this fog so that they were able to, to see the in intricacies of the kingdom. To, to be sober for the believer is not just to be unhindered, but to be profitable, like we, just what we were just talking about. This is the nature of the kingdom. We are not called merely to not be condemned, but to be pleasing to God. We're, we're not called to merely stop blaspheming, but we're called to glorify God. Yeah. We're not called to just cease from being ignorant, but to abound in knowledge. Yeah. We're not called to just cease from doubting, but to be rooted and grounded in faith. So then lastly, he says, and hope to the end. Now, if you were to ask the average churchgoer of the day, what is your hope? I'm certain that you probably wouldn't get the answer that you would, you would expect somebody who is really living by hope to say. Uh, this word hope is one uh, that along with a whole host of others, it's been hijacked by the world to the point to where it's, it's almost unrecognizable. The, the word does not mean what it means in scripture. The world's version of hope is really nothing more than uncertainty with a cloak of optimism. It, it, it's closer to the concept of wish than, the, than what the word actually means as it's used in scripture. And I've, I've heard this said before people when you ask them, you know, what is your hope? You know, are you going to end up in heaven? They say, well, I, I hope so, you know. It's like, I'm, I'm not really sure, and I would really like that to happen, so all, all that's really left is I'm just going to hope, you know. But, but hope, as we are speaking of it, it is a confident and an anxious expectation of something that's sure to come to pass, something that we can and something that we do have confidence in. This word is um, used more often to ask men, you know, what are your hopes and your dreams? Uh, I, I just seen something about this online the other day, and um, I could have swore that it was some kind of a um, self-help financial seminar or something, you know. There was, at the very bottom of the page, there was like Jesus in like this big letters, you know. It's, that's, that's what it is. When people talk about hope in the world today, that's, that's basically what they're talking about. Everybody has a trust and conf they confide in something and every has, everyone has something that they hope for that, that uh, drives their lives that they wish was true. But uh, men may live their lives according to something that they wish was true and they may direct their entire lives according to what they have convinced themselves were come to pass, but that doesn't make it true. And really, as much as, much as men would like to say that, it, that this is not true, a hope like that cannot sustain the, the interest or the devotion of a person in, in times and circumstances where the situation strongly um, seems to contradict the idea that that's, that's going to happen. In the hour of trial and tribulation, you will abandon that, that kind of a hope. Uh, this hope as, as the faith of Christ is something that transcends anything that men are able to manufacture. The hope. Faith is not as the faith of man. It's, it's not just a strong persuasion of what they think is true. It is the faith. The faith of Christ. It, it, it was the faith that was once delivered to the saints. It's something that is given of God. It's, it's, it's different. And likewise, this hope is the hope. It's the hope of eternal life, the, the hope of salvation. It's not a hope so hope. It's, 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 it is as solid as the God in whom it finds its genesis. It's not something which, we are, which is sure because we are sure of it as much as it is of itself sure. It's not true because we believe it. We believe it because it's true. It is able to cause men to forsake anything and everything to see its fulfillment. The, the scripture refers to it as an anchor of the soul. It, it is the driving force behind any and all actions of anyone who is truly following Jesus. And this hope is the hope of the gospel. This is the, the hope of this, this, meshes, this message that we have been given. Hope expectation of something that's, that's sure to come to pass. Not a message of how we can uh, live well in the present. It's not a message of how we can have a better family and better finances. It's something that circumstance can't change. This is a divine determination set in stone, unyielding and unmoving as God himself. And this is something which, which has to be seen clearly it's, if it's going to do you any benefit. Yes. You cannot and you will not give up your life for a hope that is vague. 
a, a generalized view of these things, it's not enough to sustain you through the opposition through which you must go through to obtain the promise in the end. And generally, men don't give themselves too heartily to a work which they are uncertain will gain any real benefit. People give themselves to something that they perceive is, is going to have some kind of a benefit for them. And this is especially true when we're talking about giving up everything in this life. It, it, there's no reason to do this unless you can see that there's, there's something, there are better things to be had in the world to come. Because really, what do you have in your current experience other than what is in this world if, if, if you're a man in the flesh? You have to be convinced that there's something, there's something better than that. There's something over and above what's in this world if you're going to give up your life. Now, if you spend any considerable amount of time talking to people about what awaits us beyond this life, you'll find out that this subject is, is something that a lot of people are ignorant about. This is not something that a lot of people understand. And this is a serious matter, and it, it really explains a lot why things are the way they are today. The reason why a whole host of professing believers, or believers don't live any different than the world around them is because of this, because they have no hope. There's no clear view of, of the goal. There's no definite destination. You know, you hear a lot, it's not, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And this, this is actually leaked into the church. You know, people, people don't have a definite thing to which they're looking forward to. Um, if, if you think about it this way, if, uh, you know, he says, run with patience the race that is set before you. Well, if you don't have a race set before you, then you're not going to run. As I was, I was going through this, I, I was thinking about this, this question. What, what, now, what, what specifically are we talking about here? We're, we're, we're talking about not being vague. So let, let's be specific. What is our hope? What does our hope consist of? And, and Titus 1, 2, Paul speaks of our hope as the hope of eternal life, yeah. that God, which cannot lie, promised before the world began. In Galatians 5, 5, he calls this hope, which we wait for by faith, the hope of righteousness. In Colossians 1, 27, he refers to the glory of the mystery being made known among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about glory. We're talking about righteousness. The hope of salvation is its thing that we've been given as a helmet by the Lord. It's, it's a better hope. This is a hope by which we draw nigh unto God. Mm -hmm. See, all of these things have to do with this confidence that we're, we're able to have as, uh, uh, due to the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. in, in the same chapter as our main text this morning, Peter says it this way, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope yeah. by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it's a lively hope as well. We who have this hope, we've entered into this process. So we, we've talked about this lately of, of being called, justified, sanctified, and finally glorified. So our, our hope consists of awaiting the day when we will be finally and gloriously joined with our Lord. We're talking about being forever with the Lord, having a body like unto his glorious body, things that, that, that transcend anything that this world could ever offer us. Now, this is the point where we are directed in our consideration as it concerns this hope. It's something, a specific coming event. It's not a, a general sense that, you know, everything's just going to work out good. Everything's going to be okay. As it concerns our text, namely hoping to the end, we hope to the end for the grace yeah. that is to be brought unto us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, anyone who has any familiarity with the scripture concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus will agree that this is not something that, that is just light. This is something that requires much for men to be able to abide. In 2 Peter, he says, this is what he says about this day. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and also the works that are therein shall be burned up. In 2 Thessalonians, he says it this way about, the, um, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and even with the, shall destroy with the very brightness of his coming. 
And Malachi, this is the way he said it, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. It would not be a, a very good day to be combustible or to be dirty. So what I said earlier about this effect of having a vague view of things to come, this is especially true when we're talking about the, the second coming of Christ. Uh, these scriptures that I just read, this is the manner of the coming that, uh, that we are being made ready for. It is one that men will not be able to pass through without ruin unless they rely on Christ, unless they are abiding in him. And when he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance, who is it going to be on? Those who did not obey the gospel. And when the heavens and the earth are dissolved, those who have cut their ties with the world, we're not going to be weeping on that day. We're not going to lose anything. But on the contrary, those who spend um, uh, their lifetime culturing affections for temporal things, they will lose everything. You know, it's, it's kind of ironic, really. People tell people that Jesus came so that he could make your, make your dreams come true, you know. But in reality, when he comes again, he's going to ruin and spoil all of men's hopes and men's dreams in the world. On that day, he's going to come as a thief. So, so those who have filled themselves up with the pleasures of this world, and the, suddenly and violently, they're going to have everything that they ever cared about or loved taken from them in an instant, and they will never get it back. But this is the hope of the believer, that on that great and terrible day of the Lord, we will be given grace to stand. For those who have cultured affections for the things above, we have a much different thing to look forward to on that day. Uh, According to our text, this is the day that grace will be afforded to us. Uh, I I wanted to say here um, several expressions. These are several different ways that they say it throughout the epistles. These are things that that we're going to be afforded on that day. In Ephesians 6, 13, it talks about those who have taken to them the whole armor of God, that that they could stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. That for those who live their lives diligently, taking unto themselves this armor, on that day when you are called to the judgment seat of Christ to give accounts for the deeds done in the body, you will be able to stand before him without grief and without loss. You know, I've often thought of this text as as a motivator to avoid having to explain to God why I did something that was unsavory. But uh, think about it on the other side of the coin. Imagine the joy you will have when you can stand before him and give a good report. Uh, You can actually look forward to this opportunity to to give your testimony to an assembled universe. And you can tell God why you believed him. You can tell God why you obeyed him. And 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, this is what he says about his coming. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. See, if you, if you live for Christ in this world and you give all to follow him and forsake the world, despite what hardships may come, on that day when you stand before him and hear him say unto you, well done, good and faithful servant. When you hear him um, confess your name before the Father and, and before the angels, and when you see that your name wasn't blotted out of the book of life, you're not going to have any regrets on that day. Amen. And 1 Thessalonians, this is the way he says it, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. And in 1 John, finally, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and if it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Uh, This is the hope that I commend to you this morning, brethren, to look forward to the day when those who are faithful in this life will actually be glorified together with Christ. That's something to look forward to. It's my prayer today, brethren, that the Lord would give us grace to be more excellent in this capacity, to be able to use our minds productively, to be able to to be sober, to to live unhindered from the things in the world that would, um, the worldly cares that would entangle us and that would prevent us from living according to this hope, pointed in the right direction. Thank you, brethren.